Welcome back to Voices from Healthcare. Every other week, I seek to paint healthcare in vivid color as I learn more about the human side of medicine. In this episode of Voices from Healthcare. A guy named Ray Fox, Dr. Fox, taught that course. And I would go up and ask him a question every single day. Every day I had some question at the end of lecture. And he was just this affable, great guy, told jokes all the time. And we kind of struck up a, a relationship. And he said, he was he was nearing the end of his career. He had previously been the, the department chair there, but now he was just uh, basically wasn't doing a ton of research, just taught courses, was kind of half retired. He said, you know, I have an extra desk in my office if you want to come up and, and use that desk to study. I was like, great, because otherwise I'm sitting in these you know big halls and and it was nice to have a place to put my books. So then every morning he would show up and I'd be sitting on the floor outside the door waiting for him. He said, well, do you want a key? Yeah, great. So then he gave me a key. And then I just, from that point forward, was in his office all the time. Welcome back to another episode. Today we delve into the fascinating world of cardiology, explore the unique mechanisms of the heart, and touch on cardiomyopathy and advanced heart failure. Dr. Ryan is a pediatric cardiologist who is interested in cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and heart transplantation. He also treats patients who have developed cardiovascular dysfunction as a result of cancer or cancer therapies, which is a specialty area called cardio-oncology. Dr. Ryan completed his Bachelor of Science from Wichita State University and went on to pursue his MD and PhD from the University of Alabama. He pursued fellowship in pediatric cardiology from Cincinnati Children's and completed his advanced fellowship in pediatric heart failure and transplant. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Ryan. Yeah, thanks for having me. You are the founding director of the cardio-oncology program, as well as the director of clinical operations for the advanced heart failure clinic. We'll delve into the specifics throughout the podcast, but could you give us an overview of your distinctive role within the field? Yeah. Um, I think one uh, common misconception with cardiologists is uh, the distinction between a cardiologist and a cardiothoracic surgeon. So I don't actually do surgery. A cardiothoracic surgeon would do surgery. A cardiologist primarily does the medical care uh, of patients either before surgery, after surgery, Uh, There certainly are cardiologists who do interventions like the cath lab, electrophysiology, Um, but uh, in particular, I take care of patients uh, medically. I treat before transplant, after transplant, patients who have heart failure and need medical therapies, patients who need mechanical circulatory support, so pumps that help their heart when they're, uh, usually when they're waiting for a heart transplant. Um, And so I do this both inpatient and outpatient. And uh, in addition to clinical work, most of us at an academic hospital like this also engage in research. So I, I do a fair amount of clinical research. I, my PhD is in basic research, but the, what I do now is clinical research. So asking questions about various therapies, imaging modalities, things like that. I want to touch on the educational journey. So we know that a doctor must pursue an MD or DO for his or her degree yet you pursued an MD as well as a PhD. Could you just describe that educational choice and how that kind of impacts the day-to-day? Yeah, it's uh, a bit because I was indecisive and wasn't exactly sure which of the two routes I wanted to follow as an undergrad when I was in the position that you're in. Um, I, uh, as you said, I was an undergrad at Wichita State University My dad was a lab tech, meaning that he was the guy who runs all the labs that are sent down, and so uh, I had that bit of interest in medicine. No physicians in my family, so I didn't really know um, what the reality of being a physician was or even how to become a physician. I remember in medical school I had to ask someone what a resident was because I was that uninformed. Um, But during my undergrad time, I I did research uh, with a couple of people, one guy, Dave McDonald in particular, and I really took to it. I worked as a lab assistant in several labs. I took a, a, a number of high-level genetics courses, and molecular biology courses, and I really just fell in love with research science and came to a point where I genuinely couldn't make up my mind about an MD versus a PhD. And uh, somewhere along that journey, I discovered 
something called the MSTP or the Medical Scientist Training Program, which is an NIH funded MD PhD program. So MD PhD programs don't have to be MSTPs, but all MSTPs are MD PhD programs. Okay. And that seemed to be the answer. Um, it is a combined degree in most cases. Different schools have different pathways, but at UAB, you do two years of medical school and then you basically become a graduate student until your PhD is done. And then you go back to finish up not quite two full years of medical school. You, you get out of a few of them. So the journey can take, uh, at its shortest, probably six years combined. It took me about eight and a half years. And depending on the program, some people can take longer. But the average is seven or eight years, and you end up with both degrees. Uh, one of the benefits is that an MSTP is fully funded. So medical school is paid for graduate school is paid for, and you get a living expense stipend the whole time. So while uh, most of my medical school classmates had to borrow a hundred to $200,000 to pay for medical school, medical school was fully paid for in my case, and I came out with no, with no debt, which is great. Um, the flip side of that is, again, that it took me twice as long, and when I rotated back into clinical rotation, some of my classmates were now the attendings or the senior residents, and yeah, it made for a few awkward moments. And I also remember match day when when residents find out where they're going, or I'm sorry, when medical students find out where they're going for residency. I went to my original class's match day, saw this excitement where everyone was going, what they were going to become, and then I had to go back to my lab to some failed experiment that wasn't going the way <laughs> that I needed it to. Um, but in the end, I'm really glad that I did it. Uh, it gave me critical thinking skills, appropriate research skills to to really... Uh, do any kind of research that I wanted to moving forward. And um, even though it, in some ways, slowed down the journey to becoming a physician, it really enhanced uh, a lot of it. And, and I remember in the very beginning saying to my mom, I'm not sure if I want to do this. I'm going to be 30 by the time I'm done with medical school. And she said, yeah, you'll be 30 anyway. So right. why not? I mean, it's, it's kind of a once in a lifetime chance. So um, and from, from there, I, again, I did the MD-PhD. I finished up at UAB uh, and then came from there to Cincinnati, where I started residency in 2006. And again, it was a choice. I really liked medicine, adult medicine, internal medicine, and I liked pediatrics. And I once again was faced with a choice and thought, I guess I could do med-peds. And I decided that time to put my foot down and say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to waffle this time. And I chose pediatrics because it really, during third year uh, rotations, I just loved the interactions I had with kids and with parents. And uh, I had always been interested in cardiology, cardiovascular physiology and, and science. That's what my PhD was in. Um, but I assumed I would be an adult cardiologist. And once I got into peds, that threw me a little bit for a loop because pediatric cardiology is very different from adult cardiology. But I re-found that interest in cardiology. Uh, and then once I was done with residency, I went into fellowship, cardiology fellowship. So residency was three years. Cardiology was uh, three years. And within pediatric cardiology, I again discovered heart failure as an option and knew that that's what I needed to do. And it really fit my background to that point. So that was one additional year, a fourth year of specialty training. So four years undergrad eight years MD-PhD, three years residency, three years fellowship, one year of uh, sub-sub-specialty fellowship, and at 39, I got a real job. <laughs> wow. Now, did you always have a love for medicine, even from a, a young age, or did that develop over time? Yeah, I, I, I think really the, the true interest in medicine came in high school. Medicine and science, I kind of lumped them together generically in the beginning, I had an anatomy and physiology class uh, taught by Mr. D, as we called him, Mr. Jawatsky, and it was just awesome. I, I fell in love with anatomy. As I said, my dad was always, when I was a young kid, he was a graduate student, and then when I got a little older, he worked in the hospital in the lab. So there was always some hospital-adjacent uh, feeling or environment. Um, when I would go to my dad's house on the weekends, he had all these great anatomy books that I would flip through and be slightly grossed out, but slightly intrigued. Um, and and so that was always kind of in the background. But the A&P class in high school made me really feel that science slash medicine was where I wanted to go. 
I must have talked about it a lot because at the end of high school, I was voted most likely to be a doctor, <laughs> even though I mean, this was a huge high school class and I wasn't particularly well known by everyone, but I guess I was known enough or I, I ran my mouth enough that they knew I wanted to be a doctor. And then in college, it was a little bit back and forth with the MD versus the PhD mm. um, and until I discovered that combination. How about key mentors or any formative moments that really confirmed your educational journey in medicine? There was in undergrad, there, Wichita State's not huge. It's, it's a commuter school. A lot of people who live uh, in the area drive into school there, are a number of returning adults, but it, it has a traditional undergrad population as well. But the biology department, which is what I did my degree in, was not terribly big. It was probably fewer than 20 faculty. And so I kind of got to know all of them. I took everyone's course in one form or another. And when I was a sophomore, I was in an, in, a, a major's intro bio course. And a guy named Ray Fox, Dr. Fox, taught that course. And I would go up and ask him a question every single day. Every day I had some question at the end of lecture. And he was just this affable, great guy, told jokes all the time. And we kind of struck up a, a relationship, and he said he was he was nearing the end of his career. He had previously been the, the department chair there, but now he was just uh, basically wasn't doing a ton of research, just taught courses, was kind of half retired. He said, you know, I have an extra desk in my office if you want to come up and, and use that desk to study. I was like, great, because otherwise I'm sitting in these you know big halls, and, and it was nice to have a place to put my books. And so then every morning he would show up, and I would be sitting on the floor outside the door waiting for him. He said, well, do you want a key? Yeah, great. So then he gave me a key. And then I just, from that point forward, was in his office all the time. And we became very close. Um, we had a lot of shared references for some movies that we really had in common, and, and uh, he... I worked for, as a lab tech for him. He was a botanist, uh, actually, a, a plant biochemist, so not anything that I ended up following. But he was just a great guy. With a, uh, He was an, uh, older than my parents and just had this great view on life and education. And so through working with him, I got to know everyone in the department. And I my research as an undergrad was with his lab neighbor, uh, a guy named Dr. McDonald. And I kind of really did work for everyone in the department. I taught labs, things like that. So he was really the first um, the first person who introduced me to an academic lifestyle. And then I certainly, uh, in, in graduate school, uh, my PhD mentor, Pam Lucchese and Lou Dell'Italia, she was a PhD, he was an MD, it was a very nice match. Um, they both taught me very individual and unique things. And then within residency, um, too many mentors really to name, and then when I got to, to cardiology, a lot of my current partners um, are people that that inspired me to go into the field I'm in. I, I know it's a podcast, but there's a picture over there of me kind of goofing with a, a guy. That's Jeff Tobin. He's one of the one of the fathers of pediatric cardiomyopathy. He's not he's at another institution now, but but I'm I was trained very much in his style and his vein. I call myself a Tobinite, and anyone who trained <laughs> under Jeff Tobin knows what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and Angie Lortz, one of my current partners, I was on call with her one night in the cardiac ICU as a categorical fellow, and I was telling her I thought I wanted to do imaging or become an echocardiographer. And she said, no, you don't. You're a, you're a heart failure guy. Your <laughs> research was in heart failure. You love talking to families. You love the long-term relationship. You're going to do heart failure. And so I became the first person at this institution to do the fourth year heart failure transplant fellowship. Those mentors are so valuable along the journey and they really can influence your, your ultimate direction. You've mentioned and touched on it briefly, but there is incredible diversity within the field of cardiology. There's general adult cardiologists, cardiac imaging specialists, electrophysiologists, and more. Uh, could you touch on this diversity? within cardiology and kind of how you found your unique love? Absolutely. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll speak primarily to pediatric cardiology. There are, of course, similarities between the two. But uh, within pediatric cardiology, uh, after a three-year fellowship, you are prepared to be a general pediatric cardiologist. That means, and, I, and maybe I should elaborate a little bit, because oftentimes when I tell someone I'm a pediatric cardiologist, they're not exactly sure why kids need cardiologists. 
they wonder, do kids have heart attacks? Or uh, So the bulk of pediatric cardiology is congenital heart disease. The heart doesn't form normally during development, and so kids are born with some uh, heart difference or defect. It might be as little as one of the valves doesn't open completely normally or it's leaky. There's a hole between the pumping chambers or the receiving chambers, the atria, um, all the way to one side of the heart is almost in completely uh, unformed. So a hypoplastic left heart where the left side is is basically not functional and the right side has to do all the work and that requires three surgeries within the first few years of life just to have a, a, a palliated or functional system, if you will. So after uh, three years of general cardiology fellowship, you've learned how to be an imager with echo, you've learned how to do caths, you've learned the basics of electrophysiology or EP, um, and you've spent some time in the cardiac ICU. And so at that point, you were definitely trained to manage outpatient pediatric or, or congenital heart disease, following kids who might need surgery or who've had surgery. You're ready to manage patients as an inpatient, so those who are admitted because they're in heart failure or sick or that they've had surgery and now they're post-op. Um, but then each of those can be expanded. And the, the day of the just general cardiologist is somewhat fading. Certainly smaller communities need a general cardiologist. One of my partners just left for a job in Montana and he's one of two cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists in the state of Montana, and the other one used to be a faculty member here, so I know them both pretty well. Um, so he does everything within that town, and, he, and kids that are more sick or need more advanced care have to go to Seattle, for instance. Um, but many of us do advanced training or a fourth year within those areas I mentioned. So imaging, which is echo and cardiac MRI and CT, uh, or fetal, fetal's part of that, fetal imaging. Uh, intervention, which is cath. Um, in the adult world, a lot of cath is looking at coronaries and, and intervening on coronaries. In the pediatric world, there's a lot of diagnostic caths, figuring out where blood's going, how much blood's going one place or the other, and then a lot of intervention. So putting stents in areas that are too tight or patches on areas that have holes in them, or working with the surgeons to do what's called a hybrid procedure where the surgeons do some of the work, the cath doc does some of the work, and then um, the, the kid is managed by the cardiac ICU, for instance. Uh, that's the other one of the other subspecialties within cardiology is cardiac ICU. And many of those people are trained both in pediatric ICU and cardiology. They're what we call double boarded. So they do three years of one of those two, and then two years of the other for five years combined. Um, there's electrophysiology, so the, the electricians of the heart versus the plumbers who are the cath docs. And they do a lot of procedures where they go in and find the area where the abnormal electrical activity is coming from. They burn it or freeze it. They put in pacemakers or uh, defibrillators. Um, let's see, there's adult congenital. So those are people who are adults who had heart disease as a kid and now have a unique set of issues moving forward. And so at our hospital, our adult congenital team is very robust and we'll see people as old as they come with heart uh, congenital heart disease. Those folks oftentimes are either trained as adult cardiologists and get this subspecialty training or trained as a pediatric cardiologist and get it or trained as both. A lot of those folks do med peds. Um, there is, of course, heart failure, heart transplant, which is what I do. And so I've kind of touched on that a little bit, but that's that's, in a way, general cardiology souped up a whole bunch. It's the sickest kids, the kids that need support. Sometimes you can have heart failure from congenital heart disease and need a transplant for that, and sometimes it's from a heart muscle disease that you're born with. Um, there's preventive cardiology. There's people who subspecialize in genetic subspecialties. Uh, I know I'm, I'm probably forgetting someone easy off the top of my head, but, but that's, that's a lot of it. Right. And then these things that, like I do, like cardio-oncology, are newer coming along, up-and-coming fields that even though this problem's been understood for three or four decades, the idea of subspecializing in it is, is a little more recent. In the past, it was whichever cardiologist knew the most about it or had a collection of patients that had this, might be an imager, might be a heart failure person, might be a general cardiologist. Um, in the adult world, 
you can do a fourth year in cardio oncology, mm-hmm. and because there are there are thousands and thousands of adults who have cancer, cancer treatment, or cancer survivors. In pediatrics, fortunately, it's a lot less common. So I couldn't do just that. It's one part of what I do, but um, but it is certainly something that's growing, and, and the more kids survive and do well with cancer treatments, the more of those patients there will be. Take us into the day-to-day. Uh, could you walk us through a typical day in your life and what are the daily requirements uh, kind of in your job? It's... It has to be a qualified statement because it really depends on the day. So That's right, yeah. What I would say is my my job is split into kind of four parts. And I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of, of, depending on which day, what it looks like. I have clinical duties, both inpatient and outpatient. So I guess I'm counting those as two parts. So when I manage the patients who are admitted to the hospital, that's inpatient. When I manage the patients that are coming into the clinic, that's outpatient. I have research, and kind of by contract, my research is supposed to be about 30% of my time. Some people do 80-20, where 80% of their time is clinical and 20 research, or the flip, 80% is research and 20 is clinical. Everyone kind of has their own setup. I also have a number of administrative roles, including uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, which is really important to research. It, you did research here, so you probably had to have an IRB protocol. And right. So <laughs> people have to review those and make sure that they're safe and ethical, et cetera. That's what the IRB does. It's IACUC is the same, but for animal research. it's uh, We don't need to worry about what the letters are, but it's the same thing. So a typical day for me if I'm on the inpatient service means that for a week, from Friday to Friday, I'm the person in charge of everything going on with our patients. Now, as an attending, I have fellows who are in residence who are in the hospital, nurse practitioners who are in the hospital. Um, they see the patients, they write the notes, they write the orders. Uh, they're the people who are here all night. I'm responsible 24-7 for those seven days, and I get lots of calls and I have to answer the questions, but when I was a fellow or a resident was when I stayed in the hospital and when it was the 30 plus hour shifts and the 80 plus hour weeks and those things are a little different now but still similar idea. You're the frontline person who's here doing the work. I'm at home at night. I come in if something really big is going on but I mostly manage that stuff from home. But uh, you know we do a week at a time because it can be pretty taxing and, and disruptive. You can't make a lot of plans with your family. And I do about 10 to 12 weeks of that a year. And that's a, that's a, f- a fairly full load of service. Uh, when it's outpatient, um, I have two to three clinics a week, kind of depending on the week. And clinic means exactly what it sounds like. I'm in the clinic. I see probably 10 to 15 patients depending on the day. Um, and, uh, and that takes up most of the day. It's, you know, start at 8, finish at 5 kind of thing. Um, the days that I'm not in clinic, I'm dealing with administrative issues or I have an IRB meeting or I, in this age of Zoom, I have a million Zoom and <laughs> Microsoft Teams and all those meetings. And then the research part is kind of catch as catch can. You know, you do research on your office days, on your weekends. Um, I will say that being a physician, no matter what kind of physician you are, really is a all-the-time job. And different people handle it differently. Some people are very good at setting limits and saying, when I'm on vacation, I don't check emails, or when I'm on the weekend, I don't take calls. But um, there's always work to be done, and, and I admit that I personally look at email all the time and I because I don't want to get too far behind. I'm reachable all the time, and you really, I, I think most physicians you will find want to be available to their patients if they're needed or to their colleagues if they're needed. So because I'm the person who does all the cardio-oncology stuff, the, cardi- the oncologists know to just shoot me an email if they have a concern about a patient, whether I'm on service or not. Um, and so uh, the typical day is atypical, but that kind of gives you an idea. You know, it, it could be right. from 40 to 60 hours, depending on the week, whether it's service, whether I, there's a grant deadline, whether I'm writing a talk. There's also a lot of stuff you do kind of pro bono. All the 
editorials that you write or papers that you review or um, committees that you sit on, all of that stuff is part of the job, but it's not what you're paid for. And so you have to make sure you get the stuff you're paid for done first. And then that's why there's a lot of weekend time catching up on a review or some things like that. I will fully admit, though, I, I spend as much time as I can with my kids doing their stuff, and and I uh, we're lucky because there are certain professions and, and prior generations that didn't have that, that luxury as much. That is really helpful just to touch on that diversity and that that is what's so interesting about the job is that you have all of those different avenues, and like you said, it needs to be qualified because each day you're doing something different. Mm-hmm. Um You've touched on it before, but could you just discuss the importance of bedside manner and just how effective that physician-patient relationship is? Yeah, I think that's the that's the X factor in taking care of patients. And that is something that to me is hard to teach. Um, you certainly can work on it and you can uh, you can identify your own strengths and weaknesses and understand times that maybe you could be more empathetic or you could spend a little more time or you were giving away a little too much. But I think each person really just has to be the best version of themselves that they can because anything else is going to be phony. So I'm a very talkative person. I tend to go in the room and especially with, it depends on the age of the kid, but I I, I always love to find something I know about that they like. If they're watching a show that my kids happen to watch, and they get surprised that I know the name of it, or if someone went on vacation somewhere and I happen to have gone to school there or know someone there, I just I always try to find that one thing I can connect with. Um, and it's important with parents too. And I, one pet peeve of mine when I talk to people who are going into pediatrics and I ask why do you like pediatrics. And there's a pretty common answer. And this, so this is your pro tip for the day. For anyone who interviews in pediatrics and comes to Cincinnati Children's, if I'm your interviewer, don't say to me, I love kids and I just don't like working with adults. They did it to themselves and kids, it, that kind of line of thinking. Yeah. Because one, that's not, that's not a very generous way to think. Sick people are sick people and they need help. And two, you're going to deal with adults a lot guess what? Parents are adults. (laughs) And so you still have to have a good rapport with adults and you still have to have a way that you can have a conversation with someone. And in many ways, it's harder in pediatrics because adults don't care a whole as much about themselves. They don't get as emotional or as invested. If you tell an adult they have cancer, of course it affects them. Of course it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's sad. If you tell an adult their child has cancer, that's a completely different conversation, set of emotions. Anger often comes into the equation. Par- parents can get very angry that their child's sick, and you might be the closest thing they have to blame. They mm-hmm. get very critical of each decision that comes along. If there's anything that seems like an error or a mistake, whether it is or not, then that's that can that can really be upsetting uh, for obvious reasons. And so, I think the dynamic in dealing with adults is actually more important in pediatrics. Um, but kind of to your, your question, I've, I've gone a long way around saying I, the most important thing is just to be genuine, to be yourself, and to really to be empathetic and, and try to remember that if I tell someone your child has a VSD, a ventricular septal defect, that's, it's not that big of a deal to, to me who sees it all the time. I know that surgical repair is very straightforward, very successful, very little after effects. That's a huge deal to a patient, to a parent. You're telling their kid has to have surgery. You're telling their kid could have heart failure. You're telling them their perfect kid is imperfect in some way, it sounds like, right? And so um, you just have to remember each time this is something brand new. This is something they haven't been through before, no matter how many times you've told someone about it. And and sometimes you're going to say it the wrong way, and you just have to fess up and apologize or or understand that every once in a while people will not like you. As likable as I might seem in this moment, there are some <laughs> people that just don't like me because the way I delivered news or because they just it was the wrong approach or the wrong way to hear it. And the best thing you can do is just try to understand that, not take it personally, and, and approach them on their terms. 
so, so important to look at that. Um, I want to look at the physiology of the heart a little bit. Um, could you just generally, very generally lay out the inner workings of the heart for those who may not be aware of blood flow through the heart or, or how the heart works? Uh, just kind of like generally, what are you looking for um, for the heart? Yeah, that's uh, I, that's probably what drew me into cardiology. In that physiology class in high school, the thing I loved the most was the heart. That's when I first thought, oh, I want to be a cardiologist. That and the fact that my dad had a heart attack when he was pretty young put that all in the forefront of my mind. So um, I'm a simple person, and the heart is pretty straightforward and easy to understand for me. It's not the brain, which no one will ever fully understand. It's so complex that we can't understand it, I think. The kidneys are pretty complicated, although don't tell any nephrologists I said that. <laughs> um, but the heart is really pretty straightforward, and it's fascinating. So it's four chambers. In, in its best form. You know, of course, in pediatric cardiology, we deal with a lot of hearts that don't have all of that. The myocardium or the heart muscle itself, any part of the heart can generate a beat. And you can put heart cells in a dish and they'll beat on their own because they have the potential to do that. They have the, the ion channels that allow them to do that. There's a, the pacemaker of the heart, the sinus node is in the right atrium, and it sends a signal out that causes the atrium to beat in unison, and then there's basically electrical insulation between the atria and the ventricles that stops that signal, all except for one pathway called the AV node or the atrioventricular node. So then electricity passes down the AV node and spreads through a network of nerves throughout the ventricles, and you get the ventricular contraction. So on an ECG, the first little hump, the P wave, is the atria contracting. The big spike that goes up and down is the QRS complex. That's the ventricles contracting and then the T wave the last hump at the end is the ventricles relaxing or, or resetting basically and getting ready for the next one um, now if the pacemaker is not working then the next level can take over and you can have a, a junctional rhythm so from the, a, the the AV junction basically and if that's not working then the ventricles can take over and each one of those is slower but it's your backup so um, uh, the pacemaker, when it's going, it's faster than the junctional escape or the ventricular escape, so it overpowers those. Where things can go awry is if you have some little focus somewhere in the atria that's abnormal and goes faster than the sinus node, it can take over, and then you can have a tachycardia or a fast heartbeat from that. If you have a break in the electrical insulation between the chambers, a, a pathway that allows electricity to travel up or down, then you can generate little circuits that form these four feed forward loops that get your heart into going too fast. You can have things like atrial fibrillation where the atria move fast and in, in an unorganized way. You can have ventricular tachycardia where the muscle of the bottom is beating too much. And most people have a P, an occasional PVC or PAC, an extra beat of the heart. And that's just somewhere, some amount of heart tissue said, oh, I need to beat and sent a signal through the heart. So. That's, uh, that's part of how the electrical signal travels so fast through the heart is that all those cells have the ability to conduct, but they can also be autonomous. Um, and then, you know, what I do in particular is heart muscle disease. So when there are abnormal uh, genes that lead to abnormal proteins that can cause a heart to be too thick, dilate and not function normally, have electrical problems, uh, have other malformations that cause cardiomyopathy or heart muscle disease, then you get into a whole new domain of, of potential problems. It can look normal. It can have all four chambers, but it might not function normally. And you have also done work with cardio-oncology. Could you touch on that and just kind of bring us into that world? What are you looking for uh, within that space, and what are red flags or beginning stages of warning signs that you kind of see? Cardio-oncology... Um, is a bit of a misnomer. Cardio oncology should be tumors of the heart or cancers of the heart. What it really should be called is oncocardiology. So you're a cardiologist for cancer, cancer related diseases, but everyone, it, it, those two came out at the same time and for some reason people like the term cardio oncology better. So for better or for worse, that's what it's called. Cardio oncology is the study of diseases of the cardiovascular system related to cancer or more specifically cancer therapies. The most common and kind of um, uh, 
classic example is something, a type of chemotherapy called anthracycline. So doxorubicin, and donorubicin. These are very common uh, chemotherapies that have been used and, and used to great success since the, they were discovered in the 60s and really since the 70s. But very early on after their discovery, it was known that they could cause electrical abnormalities of the heart. They could cause injuries to the tissue of the heart. And not long after they were being used, um, some patients started to develop heart failure. And this can happen right away. You, you get given the medicine and your heart goes into significant dysfunction immediately. Um, and that's usually reversible. You stop the medicine, the heart generally gets better. The more insidious form is, is the type that 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, you, there's heart dysfunction. And once that was realized, this field of, of cardio-oncology and of, of surveilling, watching patients more closely came about. Uh, the, a lot of the early work was actually done in pediatric patients because anthracyclines were being used for things like leukemias and, and solid tumors. And, and um, there, there were some big studies looking at the patients compared to their siblings and what the rate of different heart diseases was. And so there's about, depends on on how you look at the risk and whether they had radiation therapy, things like that that can add to the risk. But at least 10% or more of patients who've had those treatments will develop, can potentially develop symptomatic heart failure compared to their siblings who almost none of them do at a, at a baseline rate. So the idea is that patients who've been exposed to chemotherapies of certain sorts need some type of surveillance for the rest of their life. And usually the oncologist will do echoes and if there's an abnormal echo, they'll send them to someone like me. We're still in a very much a learning phase. One of the most recent uh, bits of research I did was with an oncology fellow where I noticed that a lot of patients were being sent to me with heart dysfunction after starting this certain type of medicine. And so we just looked at the hundred or so patients here that have been treated with that and tried to describe how many of them had heart dysfunction, did it recover once the medicine was stopped, etc. So as I said a little bit earlier, in the adult world there's so many adults who have cancer um, that places like MD Anderson have their own cardiologists. And adult cardiologists can do a fourth year in just cardio-oncology. Um, in pediatrics, even though a lot of hospitals now have a cardio-oncology program like we do here, it's not the only thing that, that most of those people do. It's just part of it. So um, because I do heart failure and transplant, uh, a lot of heart failure specialists end up doing cardio-oncology and pediatrics because the biggest problem is ventricular dysfunction heart failure. That's the most likely thing people will develop after anthracyclines. But, you know, it's a constant learning process for me. So just recently a, a patient had an ECG that had abnormalities on it and was on a medicine that I wasn't super familiar with, so I had to look and saw that, yes, this medicine can cause myocarditis or uh, ischemic heart disease. So we had to kind of quickly bring the person in, do an echo, check troponins, that kind of stuff. Um, and each new medicine that comes out, you have to have some type of cardiology surveillance because it may or may not affect the heart. So that's in a very big nutshell what cardio-oncology No, is. very, very helpful. Uh, you've touched on it before, but you've become very engaged in research while in practice. How were you first drawn into the world of research, and why do you find it valuable for medical professionals to perform research? For me, it goes back um, to the MD-PhD, and the intention of MD-PhD programs is to generate physician scientists, but that's a very broad potential definition. Um, a physician scientist might be someone who strictly runs a research lab, and because they have an MD, has access to uh, human subjects or human samples, tissue samples, things like that. You might get someone who is on the other end of the spectrum and is primarily uh, clinical, like me, and does some research, but I don't do, I did bench research as a, as a PhD student, but I don't do that anymore. But I still use the same kind of critical thinking and setting up experiments that I did. And then some people are in between. Um, as an academic cardiologist, which is what most pediatric cardiologists are going to be, most of us are going to be at a pediatric hospital like this, at least the majority will. And it's really just kind of part of the job. You have to have some academic component. 
And for some people that's teaching, it's research, it's quality improvement research. There's a million ways to define it. But all of us have, uh, I, I don't think there are any cardiologists at this institution who don't do some type of research, who are purely clinical. Um, because I have an academic appointment through the university. I mean, it's an academic position. Uh, the reason it's important is that's the only way the field moves forward. The only way that we know if uh, we can prevent cardiotoxicity from these medications is to try things that might prevent it or to alter the, the regimen of medications that someone gets. Um, you know, every important treatment that we use now started as research. Uh, and you have to prove that something works before it's generally accepted or used. And sometimes it's not even that easy. It's really hard to change minds. Yeah. But a lot of the research we do is multi-center, especially in pediatrics, because when a new medicine comes along, you have to prove that it's safe and effective in large groups of patients. And in pediatrics, we just don't. No one center has a 1,000 patients with diagnosis X because it's much less common than adults. So adult studies might have 50,000 participants, and pediatric study, you're good to get a couple of hundred. Um, and so usually the, the research has to be multi-center. So I've been part, for instance, of right now we're, we're taking part in a, a study looking at a specific combination of anti-rejection medicines in transplant patients compared to another combination of medications. And that took place at 30 plus hospitals because each hospital we recruited fewer than 10 patients, but the study total recruited 300 patients. And so you have to have 30 or 40 hospitals to do that. I want to look uh, into the world of transplants a little bit. You've alluded to it. Um, what are the doctors and medical professionals looking for in finding a match for a heart donor? To take a step back, you have to ask who gets a heart transplant or who needs a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. And a heart transplant is really a treatment of last resort or last option. So if there are no surgical options, if there are no medical options for good quality of life, long-term survival, then transplant is considered. The reason for that is a transplant is not a permanent fix. The, there's a, average is the wrong word. We use something called a half-life, but if you want to think about the average time that a transplant is going to last, uh, someone in the best case scenario, a, a kid, kids have better long-term survival after transplant than adults, but you're looking at 20 to 25 years. So if a two-year-old gets a transplant, they will, under the current way we take care of patients, there's an, almost a guarantee that they will need a transplant again by the time they're a young adult, if not sooner. Um, so that's the first thing that you have to understand is that we don't jump right to transplant. The second is that the donor pool obviously is, is very limited. There are way more people who need transplants than get transplants. But once someone's listed, they're going to wait for a while, and it's usually months to years depending on how, what their status is, how high they're listed. The higher your status, the more sick you are, basically. If you're in the hospital on support of some sort, you're a, what's called a 1A. If you're at home doing okay, you're a 2. And the difference in wait time can be three to six months for a 1A to multiple years for a 2. Um, but when someone's listed, the, the things that we have to match up with a potential donor are size, and pediatric size is a big deal because a two-year-old can't get a, an 18-year-old's heart. Um, blood type is very important except for the youngest patients, so A, B, or O, A, B, those blood groups have to be matched, remembering who can be universal donor and who can be universal recipient, and maybe you talk to a hematologist in another <laughs> podcast. Um, the youngest kids can get what's called ABO incompatible if they don't already have the antibodies generated, and that's a, a long story, but for the most part, you have to match up blood group. Uh, and then you have to match up something called HLA type. Make sure that the recipient doesn't have antibodies against all these other proteins that are kind of the fingerprint of our cells. Once all those factors come into play, then you consider once you hear the donor story, because when I'm on call, I get the call from the donor agency saying we have this patient, this donor, and, and I get to know all the details, which I don't share with the family for confidentiality reasons, but I, I get to know how the donor, what, what happened to them, what their heart looks like now, and then these various lab values. And if all those things match up, then, then we can accept the heart. Um, but 
the reasons it takes a long time is one, it's it's hard to match all those things up, and two, fortunately, the donor pool, fortunately and unfortunately, but the donor pool in kids is small, because some child unfortunately has to die to become a donor. So it's mm-hmm. it's a real hard reality for for families. You know, they of course want their child to be transplanted, but they realize that it means someone else is is losing a child. So that's why we have to be so very careful and and make sure that we're making the right match and and honoring the donor as best we can by ensuring that their gift lasts as long as possible. There's just so much that goes into it, and you're right. There's that aspect of uh, the patient that's receiving that transplant, someone else has to be giving that transplant, and there's that other side of the story. Um, Within the world of cardiology, what do you see in the future of cardiology that excites you in the next couple of years or even now in the field? Within the world of transplant, uh, the hot, the current hot topic, but also the hot topic when I was maybe five or ten years old is the xenotransplantation, xeno with an X, meaning animal donors. So in 1984, Four, I think it was, baby Faye received a baboon heart. She didn't survive very long, but it was proof of concept that you could potentially use an animal donor for a human. The more likely pathway for that is genetically modified pigs because even in the best human-to-human match, the recipient will recognize that as foreign for the rest of their life, and they have to be on immunosuppression for the rest of their life. And even on immunosuppression, they could potentially generate, uh, uh, re- they could generate rejection and, and, and die from rejection. So that's the biggest barrier we face. You add xenotransplantation to that, and the heart is that much more different to the person. So, so there are ways to genetically modify animals, usually pigs, because they have a pretty similar physiology and size. And if you can get them to express enough human antigens and uh, uh, fewer of the, the animal antigens, the pig antigens that might be too immunogenic, then that's one that could potentially farm organs. That has a lot of ethical issues with it because then you're raising animals only to serve as donors. And is that different from raising animals for food? I don't know, but that's, that's one of the potentials. Another is to use uh, basically to grow a heart for someone with their own stem cells, have a, a some type of a matrix that that their cells can adhere to and then form a heart. That's further away for sure, but that would be a way to give someone a heart that they would never reject because it's their own tissue. And then mechanical support, VADs, ventricular assist devices, artificial hearts. Um, we do a lot of that, but those really aren't great permanent solutions. There are people who have VADs for five and ten years at home, but they still are reliant on a power source or a battery. There are some fully implantable VADs, but they don't last very long and they're not used regularly. Um, so as componentry and mechanics gets better and better, will there be something that can last, uh, that's expected to last much longer term or that can be fully implantable? or that can, uh, the total artificial heart is something people can go home on, but it's still pretty, pretty burdensome and limiting. Although there are stories of people doing marathons or climbing mountains and things like that with these total artificial hearts, but ultimately they still are headed towards a transplant. And taking a look at, um, outside of medicine, outside of the practice of medicine, what brings you joy outside of the practice of medicine? Do you have any passions, loves, hobbies outside of the walls of the OR and the hospital? Yeah, the the cliche but very true answer is my family. And, and you're pointed right at pictures of my kids. I have uh, right. 10-year-old twins who um, really change the, the math when they came along, you know. You can be very dedicated and focused on career and sacrifice lots of other stuff until kids come along and you really can't sacrifice that. So um, they are uh, really what I spend the bulk of my time on outside of work. Um, and, and just watching them grow up into little people is, uh, is, 
is probably the best thing. My wife is someone that I've been with for pretty close to 30 years at this point and has uh, gone through this with me. She also is trained in medicine and understands the the work and, and what it takes and, and is um, a perfect match to all my my failings or or personality flaws. She has the, the right mix and the right answer to that. And so she's, uh, I, I really, this is not a solo effort. I couldn't do this without her and her support. Uh, I've always, uh, I first started um, working out and lifting weights when I was 11. I remember very specifically the movie that inspired it and getting a weight set for my grandpa for Christmas that year. And so I actually wake up pretty early each day so that I can get my workout in without taking time away from the kids at night. And that's the thing that, as goofy as it is, that's kind of the thing that centers me and, and gives me that that physical outlet um, that this very mentally stressful job can can put on you sometimes. Um, and... Uh, those are, you know, those are kind of the main things. I used to, I used to play basketball, but time and knees are not <laughs> cooperating with that as much anymore. And and um, and just the usual kind of uh, time outside, time with friends, time with family. There's a lot of mental stress, and there's a lot of that academic pressure at times. So having those outlets is really, really important. Yeah. Um, in terms of advice, what encouragement would you give to an aspiring healthcare? professional, someone who's in their undergraduate years and is just beginning their love for medicine, what advice would you give them? Probably the most important thing and something that I didn't do very well was to learn as much as you can going in. So you're going in eyes wide open. There's a lot to this career that I didn't know much about, I didn't understand. Um, it is, uh, as I think I said earlier, kind of an all-in type of career. It, it can be pretty all-consuming. I think any anything that you care about and that you want to be good at is that way. I don't mean to, to martyr physicians and say that we work harder or we care more. I think a, a passionate lawyer or someone who is a carpenter and loves their job is going to obsess over things the same way. But you really have to understand how all-consuming this can be. You also have to know your yourself personally and emotionally because this job, um, if you let it, it can run over you and really affect you with a lot. I, I mean, it depends on what you go into, but what I do, there are a lot of unfortunate times when patients are not doing well, when patients pass away, and you have to have that right balance of uh, being compassionate and empathetic towards the families, but not letting it um, distract you from the other patients that you have to care for and, and being present for your family. So you really have to, I think, to choose what path is right for you within medicine, because there's a million paths, it's best to really explore and do what you're doing and understand what the job is, what the job means. Um, but in the end, when you're passionate about it and it's something that you see yourself as becoming a doctor and there's not much else you want to do, no one's going to persuade you one way or the other. So I think the best thing to do is figure out within medicine what's a good path for you. And the more you know about it, the better. Like I said, I, I legitimately didn't know what a resident was versus an intern when I was in in medical school. And I asked a resident once, I said, what's, what's the difference between a resident and an intern? Which for anyone who doesn't know, an intern's a first year resident. Um, so the more you know, the better prepared you're going to be. And just making sure that it's the, this is what you want to do. Because there are, you know, not an insignificant amount of people that get through the training and realize this is not right for me. I don't like how this is taking me away from my other interests or my family or um, the, it's very stressful. I'm emotionally drained. I mean, obviously COVID has put a significant stress on most everyone, but, but there are a lot of people who turn away from medicine pretty early in their careers and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If things are hard, uh, not just suppressing it and hiding it away because there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of substance abuse and self-harm and things like that in the world of physicians as well. And so people need to understand that that uh, you, even though it's an important job, you can't let it take over your life. you got to make sure that you take care of yourself. 
And then just in closing, any practical advice for an aspiring cardiologist and someone specifically interested in that field? Is there anything that they can do in their undergraduate years and just throughout their education? As a pre-med, you're going to have to take certain courses to qualify for med school and to um, and to uh, take the MCAT successfully, etc. So my advice is you will get plenty of training in the stuff you need to know when you're in residency and in cardiology. Do the stuff that interests you because mm -hmm. even though you can always read a book about Abraham Lincoln or whatever it is, if you love history, get a degree in history, minor in history. It might be a little more work to double major or spend an extra year catching up on the med school, the pre-med stuff you need, but but don't make this the only thing that's interesting about you. You know what I mean? Hmm. Like make yeah. sure that if there's other stuff you like, that's that's cool. There's plenty of people who came to med school with English degrees and history degrees and and things like that. Um, so you know, nothing's going to nothing gets you ready for this. You just you have to jump in. You know, it's not like because this woman had genetics 500 level course and I didn't, she's a better resident than me. It's just not going to happen. Residency, yes, it's about knowledge. It's about being able to pack away information. But it's really, residency, fellowship, success in those is really about uh, determination, hard work, uh, discipline, focus. Those kind of things are what makes you successful. Being caring, being compassionate. Those are the things that really get you through. I mean, that some of the best physicians I know have the lowest testing scores because that's not necessarily that important. And some of the worst physicians I know aced every exam <laughs> along the way. You know, it, those things aren't predictors. Those tests are meant to, to make sure you have the minimum amount of knowledge to progress to the next step. And we get we all get way too caught up in, oh, their MCAT was, I don't even remember what a good MCAT is anymore, you know, 38 or 40 or something. Yeah, okay. That's great, but it really was just meant to say, do you know this basic amount of knowledge, yes or no? Hmm. And then I remember when I was a resident about to become a fellow, I was shadowing one of my current partners. He's just down the hall now. I was shadowing him in clinic and his fellow. And so I was talking to him. I was facing the attending cardiologist, and his fellow was behind him looking at me, so the attending couldn't see the fellow behind him. And I asked a similar question. I asked, uh, you know, in the next three months as I'm wrapping up residency, what should I do to get ready for residency? Is there a book I should read or a text I should review? And the attending started to give me some thoughts, you know, well, you could, the same stuff I would say to someone. And the fellow behind him did this motion where he put his hands together and his head on his hands like to tell me, sleep. You need to sleep for the next <laughs> three months because you're not going to sleep much when you're a fellow. You know, basically he was saying to me, don't don't get caught up in that. You have three years of fellowship to learn how to be a cardiologist. You're not going to do anything in the next three months that's going to make you a better cardiologist. So just enjoy the journey along the way. Hit, get the stuff you have to get, obviously, but have fun with it. Make sure you do stuff you like to. Don't just do stuff because you're told to. That's so valuable to not just be focused on career all the time, but to to incorporate all of your loves and your passions and you're right it can't be everything that you are and you will get that training eventually as you as you progress um, well, dr ryan it's just been an absolute pleasure to to sit down with you to delve into the world of cardiology a little bit and thank you for coming on the podcast well thanks for inviting me i hope that uh i have one or two useful things for your audience and for sure. best of luck to you with your journey and i hope everything goes uh as well as you want it to Thank you for tuning into this episode of Voices from Healthcare. This podcast seeks to give practical advice to aspiring healthcare professionals and encourage those within the healthcare field. If you appreciate the message and mission of this podcast, leave a rating and review on the platform you are listening to and make sure to follow the podcast so that you do not miss out on future episodes. It really does help spread the word within the podcasting world. Tune in on September 27th as I sit down with a clinical pharmacist and explore this fascinating world. We touch on the unique PharmD degree and look into her regular collaboration with doctors on the floor. I'll understand the key role of mentorship as well as the physiology of pharmaceutical drugs. 
I'll gain an inside look into medical research and hear about her perspective and retrospective studies. She will share insights on how she stays up to date with newly released drugs and recent drug changes. We'll talk about what brings her joy outside the practice of medicine, as well as her non-negotiables in life. Feel free to send me professions you want me to interview, questions you have, or neat stories you want to share with me. You can email me at voicesfromhealthcare at gmail.com. Although this podcast seeks to be informative, information discussed cannot be taken in place of medical advice.